So we've been talking the last several weeks, or ever since Easter Sunday, really about this gift of the Holy Spirit. Scripture says, everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved and shall receive this gift of the Holy Spirit. We've been just walking through that. Who is this Holy Spirit? It's the third person of the eternal triune God. It's the very Spirit of God that indwells the believer. We've been looking at the work of the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit does in our lives, how we can, on a regular basis, expect to experience God's very presence in our life. We've talked about how we can quench that work, we can grieve that work, we can resist it, we can choose not to keep in step with the Spirit, and so even as we read in Scripture what is the ordinary work of the Spirit, we may not be experiencing that because we're grieving or we're quenching or we're resisting that work, but this is what the Spirit does, and we've looked at these things. Today I want us to kind of change a little bit and think about, instead of the ordinary work of the Spirit, the extraordinary work of the Spirit. The things that the Spirit of God does uh, that we would just say are extraordinary, right? So I can, uh, Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, when it says that the, they were gathered in the upper room and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. It filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them and they began they were filled with the Holy Spirit began to speak in other tongues and people with other languages can hear and understand what they were saying. That's an extraordinary work of the Spirit. There's no other evidence in the book of Acts that that happened like that again, that there was the sound of a mighty rushing wind, that there was a physical manifestation of the Spirit of God in tongues of fire, and this gift of being able to speak in tongues, and people in other languages can hear what you're saying. That was kind of a one-time extraordinary experience. Acts chapter 4, it says that the place where they had gathered, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and the place where they had gathered was shaken. The physical place where they had met for church that day was shaken. Now, we don't see that as a normal experience of worship. That was an extraordinary work of the Spirit. Or in Acts chapter 7, when Stephen is given his speech, it says that he was full of the Spirit. He gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now, lots of people have visions and have dreams. This wasn't a vision or a dream. And through the Holy Spirit, he was able actually to see the glory of God and Jesus at the right hand of God the Father. Now, that's an extraordinary work of the Spirit. That doesn't happen on a normal basis. That doesn't never happen to me. I don't know if it's happened to you, but it's extraordinary work of the Spirit. Or in Acts chapter 8, when Philip is on the road and he meets this Ethiopian official and the Spirit says, go talk to him. And he goes to talk to him and he's reading the scroll in his chariot and Philip explains Isaiah and how it points to the Messiah and this, this guy becomes a believer and so he's baptized. And it says, immediately when they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away and the eunuch saw him no more. But Philip found himself at Azotus. I mean, the Spirit of God physically took him from one physical location and took him to a, another physical location. Now that's the extraordinary work of the Spirit. That's never happened to me. I don't expect that on a regular basis happens to you. I mean, one day it's going to happen to me because I will be buried and I will be in one physical location and God is going to take me to another. But it doesn't, it's an extraordinary work of the Spirit. And you go on and on through the book of Acts and we see ways that God moves. They're extraordinary. Not ordinary, not uh, typical, but extraordinary. And what I'd like for us to do today is to have a conversation about one specific, extraordinary way that the work of the Holy Spirit continues to move and that we might experience. And I want to use the word for you this morning, the words awakening, a spiritual awakening. A spiritual awakening is when the Spirit of God moves in such a way that begins to awaken a group of people. So think, think of it like this. Renewal is a word that we would use that would describe one person when their individual walk with Christ is awakened or is enlivened is renewed. They are renewed. Revival is a word that we would use to describe when that happens to a congregation. An entire church congregation is awakened and is renewed in their spiritual life. Awakening is something altogether different. Awakening is when God falls on not just one individual and not just one congregation, but falls on 
falls on a nation, falls on a territory, falls upon an area, and as the Spirit of God moves, everyone in that area is awakened. It's a period where you see mass conversions, where you see mass confessions, you see mass people moving uh, towards God and moving away from, e- uh, from evil, and a renewed sense of worship, a renewed sense of God, a spiritual awakening. And one of the things that... Uh, Uh, We know that spiritual awakenings are real, not just because we read of such things in Scripture. Our own national history has experienced two, what historians call, two great awakenings in our nation's history. So if you'll just indulge me this morning, I want to tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about the great, uh, the first great awakening. And I want, uh, I'm doing this for a reason, I'm leading us somewhere, I, I want to ask us a question here at the end after you hear this story, the story of the First Great Awakening. First Great Awakening happened, most people, historians date it back to the year 1734, so do your history math there, that's 40 years before the Declaration of Independence, so the United States of America doesn't even exist yet, it's just the 13 colonies. And even though the pilgrims had come to the New World in the early 1600s for religious freedom and to worship, by the 1700s, the church really had entered a period what historians call dead orthodoxy. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that word. Orthodoxy means right beliefs. So you know what dead orthodoxy means. They believed the right things, but there was just no life in, in the church. It was a time of nominal Christianity. Nominal means in name only. So you had all these people who in name said, yes, I'm a Christian, yet they lived absolutely no differently than anyone else in the colonies. The pagans and the confessed believers all lived and looked the same. So they were Christian in name only. And the religion was very perfunctory. That word perfunctory just means you're going through the motions. There's no, uh, there's no emotions, there's no feeling to it, you're just kind of going through the motions. So this picture of dead orthodoxy, nominal Christianity, perfunctory worship, ought to sound familiar to you. It ought to sound familiar to you because if you go back and read the prophets in the Old Testament, that was exactly the problem that Israel had when God began to send the prophets upon them. Uh, The people of God were wearing the name of God, but it didn't really mean anything. They were worshiping other gods, disobeying His commandments. There was a lot of religious activity going on, but it was just going through the motions kind of thing, and and the people of God was just dead orthodoxy. They had the right beliefs, but they were absent of any kind of power. Also ought to sound familiar to you, too, because uh, it's kind of the state of America today. I mean, what, 70% of Americans would identify themselves to be Christians? Do you really think 70% of the people in America live the kind of life that says they have denied their self, take up their cross, and follow follow Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. They just have the name. Uh, A lot of churches in America are dead orthodoxy, right beliefs, but there's no life that is there. So, anyway... Around the 1700s, though, in this midst of this dead orthodoxy, there were beginning to be many people who were hungering for, and the historical phrase that they used was a personal religious experience. Now, you and I would probably use the phrase a personal relationship with Christ. It's the same way. It's to say that we ought to have a heart connection to this God and not just going through the motions at church. There ought to be a love relationship between us and God. There ought to be something personal. There ought to be something experiential that's happening here. It's not just going to a building one time a week. And there began to be a hunger for that to have their affections and a relationship with God. And one of the leading figures in the First Great Awakening is a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards. I want you to know a little bit about Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards was born in the year 1703. He went to Yale uh, to study. When he graduated from Yale, he became associate pastor at the Congregational Church of Northampton, Massachusetts. And everything was going along fine. And in 1729, the pastor suddenly died at that church. And so they called him to be the senior pastor at that church. He was 26 years old. The year was 1729. Jonathan Edwards was a man who had personal renewal and his affections were plugged in to his God now Jonathan Edwards was not a charismatic figure he was not he would not have fit the model of being the famous TV preacher today he wasn't charismatic didn't have a lot of energy matter of fact Jonathan Edwards is known to writing his sermons out manuscript style and he would read them to the congregation and they lasted for over an hour exciting right for God so loved the world that he gave his only... You want to do that for an hour? Right? So Jonathan Edwards, he was a theologian. He was very heady. He, he wrote lots of things. He wrote deep theological works. We have like 1,200 copies of manuscripts of his sermons that he wrote out. 
He was not this charismatic kind of guy, but he had a personal renewal. He had a relationship with Christ that was real. Every morning he would go out and he would walk in the woods. And he would read scripture in the woods and he would pray in the woods. And the way that he journaled, I don't know why he did this, but he would tear out scripts of paper and he would write things on the the scripts of paper and then he would pin them to his jacket as he's walking through the woods. And when he got home, his wife would unpin all the things from his jacket and then he would set them on his desk and he would write, you know, because he was a writer. So he would write out something based upon his his devotion. He just wrote and wrote. But he he had a love relationship with God. 1729, he became pastor of this church, dead, orthodox, nominal, perfunctory church, and he began to preach. He began to talk about a a personal experience with God. He began to talk about a personal relationship with God. He began to talk about our affections, making a connection to this living God. And then in 1734, five years later, something happened. The reason we know so much about the Great Awakening is because Jonathan Edwards wrote about it. Matter of fact, he, he wrote a book called The Faithful Narrative of the Surprising Work of God. And it went through 20 printings, and it was published in London, published in England, it was published all over. He wrote this narrative, and in his narrative, on December of 1734, he wrote, and I quote, the Spirit of God began extraordinarily to set in and wonderfully to work among us. And something happened. He didn't preach any different. He didn't develop a different preaching style. He didn't start using PowerPoint or any of that kind of stuff. He was still up there reading his same sermons. But the Spirit of God fell. And in his own descriptions of what begins to happen as he would preach, people would begin to weep. People would begin to wail. People would begin to faint as they were hearing the Word of God preached. Several times when he was preaching, it got so loud, the people were wailing, the people were weeping. He actually had to stop his sermon and say, could y'all, quiet, could y'all uh, cry a little less loudly, please, so I can make it through the rest of my sermon. There was this, the spirit fell, and there was this emotional outburst as the affections suddenly were plugged in to worship, and the extraordinary work of God set in among us. And then in 1740, six years later, a man by George Whitfield came from England to the colonies. What Jonathan Edwards was as a theologian, George Whitfield was as a preacher. He was an electrifying, charismatic kind of preacher. And when he arrived in 1740, he arrived, and one historian put it this way, bristling, crackling, and thundering to an area electrified with expectancy. And he began to preach, and crowds would gather, crowds of 5,000, crowds of 8,000. In his last sermon before he returned back to London, he preached to 20,000 people. This is 1740 with no microphones, no anything. He was just preaching. People were weeping. People were wailing. People were fainting. People, the, The Spirit was falling. He was screaming and shouting as he was preaching the Gospel. And the awakening was falling all across the colonies. And not everybody was happy. In fact, there were some religious leaders who regarded this entire awakening and all the emotional excesses that were coming with it. They they saw it as the work of the devil. Historians refer to them as the old lights. Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield were the new lights. And the old lights thought it was just all bad. Everything that was happening was bad. All the emotional outpouring, it was just all bad. The new lights, Jonathan Edwards and George Whitfield, both understood something very important. That when the Spirit of God falls, the spiritual forces of darkness attack. And what had happened is the spirit had fallen and the spiritual forces of darkness were trying to disrupt and to pervert and to confuse and do everything they could to steal the great awakening away. See, the spiritual forces of darkness don't really care much for dead orthodox church. They'll just kind of let y'all, let dead dogs lie, right? Uh, But when the spirit falls, spiritual forces of darkness go to work. And it created this this messy revival. And Jonathan Edwards actually, believe it or not, wrote a book called The Distinguishing Works, Distinguishing Marks of a Work of the Spirit of God. And he wrote out against all these old lights and says, look, just because it's new, don't reject it. Just because there's some emotional excesses, don't reject that. You can't really tell the, the marks of genuine revival by how people respond in a pew. And in his book, he said, these are the five true signs of revival. 
It says, you know revival's coming when one, it raises the esteem of Jesus. The name of Jesus is held with respect. Right? The name of Jesus is not held with respect today in our culture, right? But you know revival happens when suddenly the name of Jesus is held with esteem. Secondly, there's a genuine repentance from sin. There are stories in the First Great Awakening and in the Second Great Awakening in these small towns that saloons and brothels would just shut their doors and it's not because there was a law passed against them, it was simply because they didn't have any customers. There, were, there was no one else buying what they were selling because there was such confession and repentance and walking away from sin, they just closed down. Third thing, there was a greater response to Scripture. There's a greater love for Scripture. People hunger for Scripture. They want to hear Scripture taught. They want to hear Scripture read. They want to read it themselves. There's a love for Scripture. Number four, there's, they more clearly see the difference between spiritual truth and spiritual error. The heresy, the false teaching, that becomes very obvious and truth becomes valued. In the fifth sense is there's a new sense of love towards God and towards others. There's a passion about loving the Lord and there's a passion about loving your, uh, your neighbor, loving your enemy, loving the stranger of loving others. So just to summarize what happens, the Spirit of God falls, spiritual forces of darkness rise up against it. Some uh, old religious leaders want to say it's all of the devil and they want to stop it. In fact, when George Whitfield he toured the colonies, he went back to England for a while, and then he comes back to the colonies for a second tour, and some of these old light, uh, politi- uh, religious figures met him on the pier there in Boston and said, we are not happy to see you. And George Whitfield said, well, I'm sure the devil's not either. (laughs) Uh, They were wanting to stop it. But then there were others who realized this is a work of God. First Great Awakening lasted in our country about 20 years. During that time, for instance, in the New England colonies alone, the number of churches more than tripled. It went from 21 churches to 79 churches in the New England colonies. They estimate that 7% of the entire population of the colonies of the 13 colonies, joined a church and began attending church as a result of the Great Awakening. Now, to put that in perspective, there's 319 million people in America right now. 7% would be about 22.5 million people. Membership of Southern Baptist Convention, the largest Protestant body in the U.S., is about 16 million. So if a Great Awakening happened today and 7% of the population responded to that, it would more than double the Southern Baptist Convention. You're talking about a huge outpouring. So why am I taking you through a history lesson of the First Great Awakening? Here's the point, okay? I read an article this week that talks about the patterns of spiritual awakening. Looking back at the First Great Awakening, Second Great Awakening, other awakenings across the world, patterns of spiritual awakening, and look at these patterns. The first pattern is it's preceded by times of spiritual depression, apathy, and gross sin. Hey, if you're looking for a an opportunity for revival that needs the recipe of dead orthodoxy, nominal Christianity, and perfunctory religion. Hey, America is a place for you, right? We are ripe for spiritual awakening. Second thing, second pattern, is at the beginning, individuals or groups begin to seek the Lord. Individuals begin to go after God on their own, very serious about confession and repentance and holiness, bowing to forsake it all to follow Christ, not because it's trendy, not because they get a t-shirt, not because everybody else is doing it, but because their heart is set on Him. In other words, they have their own go-to-the-woods experience where they go after God on their own. Third pattern is groups begin to gather to pray. And not just one prayer meeting, and not just two prayer meetings, and not just for a couple of weeks, but for weeks, for months, for years. Jonathan Edwards' church was gathering for prayer for five years before this began to happen. They meet and they pray. They yearn for an outworking of the Spirit. Next pattern is that God usually raises up a leader, and it's usually an unlikely leader. No one thought Moses would make a good leader. No one thought Paul would make a good leader. No one certainly thought that Jonathan Edwards was going to be the charismatic figure of the Great Awakening. He was not that. Then we begin to see uh, more and more Christians take part in what this author called the higher Christian life. They get serious about their faith, serious about spiritual discipline, serious about worship, serious about confession, serious about reading Scripture, serious about serving God, serious about loving others. And then when the Spirit falls, what happens? It awakens and it brings fervency and emotions into worship. 
when the church gathers in corporate worship, there's something happens when the Spirit falls. There, there is this emotion. There are these affections that return to worship. The next pattern of spiritual renewal is the enemy sets in. And the enemy sets in, and I mean this phrase as theologically as I can say it, all hell breaks loose. Because hell releases the forces, spiritual forces of darkness upon the revival to try to stop the revival, try to turn the focus to the emotional excesses themselves, trying to fill in false teaching, trying to bring division. And finally, the last pattern, is there are many people within the church who will reject the awakening, choosing the nominal Christianity and reject the awakening because it's just neater and it's just cleaner. So, I, I say all this, and, and this is kind of the point of this morning. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, and we talk about the ordinary work of the Spirit, we talk about what the Spirit does and how we can expect to experience the work of the Spirit, one of the things that we inevitably begin to hear and people begin to say is we need to pray for revival. We need to pray for revival. I just want to ask you the question this morning, do we really want revival? Because this is what it looks like. See, the, the extraordinary work of the Spirit is not just limited to biblical times. We have it in our own national history. We, we had the first great awakening, the second great awakening, and we, we see exactly what happens when there's a spiritual awakening, when there's revival. First of all, it's preceded by people who are hungry for the extraordinary work of God, and they go after it themselves. A lot of times people will say, we need to pray for revival, pray for revival. But what they really are expecting is that someone else is going to do the work and that all those other people are going to change. And spiritual awakenings happen when individual believers realize that it starts with me. And I have to go after Jesus on my own. And I will spend morning after morning walking through the woods, reading Scripture, worshiping, praying, whether anyone else comes with me or not. So we talk about we pray for revival. Do you really want it? Are we really uh, intent on being the one who will do the work? We see that revival is brought about by people who really seek the Lord in, in prayer. Not just go to one prayer meeting. I just go to a couple of prayer meetings, but week after week after week. Let me tell you why prayer meetings are one of the lowest attended meetings in our church calendar. It's because they're work. If, if you have kids, you know this expression, you know, you get your kids out and they're going to help you do some kind of project. And very quickly, it starts off kind of, it's like play. Oh, we get to play with tools? You know, and then suddenly it turns into work somewhere. It's like, well, this isn't fun. This is like work. It's like, yeah. Uh, and then suddenly they're gone. Um, a lot of times that's kind of what happens with the prayer life of a church. It starts off and it's, it's kind of fun. It kind of feels good, you know. And, and then suddenly just the, the work sets in. Prayer is spiritual warfare and it is spiritual work. And revival and awakening is preceded by groups of people who who seek the Lord week after week after week after week when there's only two other people who show up and there's only two other people who show up and there's only two other people who show up and we're praying the same thing week after week after week. Do you want awakening? Do we really want revival? Now the reason I ask the question is because the reality is awakenings are messy. When the Spirit falls, you, you know, read 1 Corinthians, read the book of Acts, look at the first great awakening, look at the second great awakening. All of the evidence says when the Spirit falls and the spiritual forces of darkness attack, everything gets, gets really messy in there. And as emotions get involved in worship, some people are going to express their emotions differently than you express your emotions, and it may make you uncomfortable, and it gets really messy. Do we want that? And just in case we wonder, is it right to bring emotions into worship? Any of y'all watch uh, the Belmont Stakes yesterday? The Triple Count winner, first time in how many years? Since 1970-some-odd. 
We now have a triple crown winner. And so all those people who pay like $400 a ticket to watch this horse come in first, and it comes across the finish line. Does anybody have, have a clue what I'm talking about? I, like, y'all are all football fans. Like, is there a horse racing? I didn't know what's going on. Uh, anyway, the triple crown winner, and it crosses the finish line, and the entire stadium of all these people who've been pumped up for this for four decades, they all sit in their seats and say, Amen. No, they were jumping up out of their seats, they were screaming, they were shouting, they were, they were yelling, they were excited, they naturally brought their emotions. Do we really want the Spirit to fall and people to bring their emotions to worship? Or do we find ourselves praying, Lord, we, we want You to move in extraordinary ways, we'd just prefer if You would do it the way You ordinarily do it. And God's got to be thinking, how do I even answer that prayer? How do I move in extraordinary ways but do it in something that's ordinary? The reality is that there will be a lot of religious people who will not like the awakening. There's a lot of Pharisees who would prefer dead orthodoxy and everything to be in its place where there's no conflict. Awakenings lead to life change. Significant life change. And so I ask the question, is this really what we want? One final historical note here, Jonathan Edwards, born 1703, becomes pastor 1729, uh, revival, awakening breaks out 1734, 1750, church fired him. Church fired him because he was convinced that uh, you should be a believer to partake in the Lord's Supper. The rest of the church said, no, we ought to let everybody come. And they got into conflict over that, so they fired him. The leading figure in the first great awakening and the church where it all started, they fired him. He goes off to the uh, western frontier to be a missionary to the, uh, American, to the Native Americans there, sharing the gospel there on the frontier. Does that for eight years. Finally, he gets a job opportunity back east. The university that would become Princeton University asked him, invited him to come back and be the president of Princeton University. So in 1758, he goes back and he uh, takes the position of presidency of Princeton University. Two months later, two months later, two months later, he gets a smallpox vaccination and drops dead. Yay! Why did I say all that? If, if you're thinking spiritual awakening is a way to make your life easier, then you misunderstand. If you think spiritual awakening is a way to make your life more exciting and, and lift your name up and, and make other people think more highly of you, you're missing the picture. Jonathan Edwards spent years in the forest seeking God on his own. Spent five, six, seven years preaching to a congregation about spiritual revival. Suddenly, the Spirit falls. And there's all this chaos in his church. He has to deal with religious leaders at other churches. They're coming and telling him he's doing it wrong, doing it wrong, doing it wrong. This is of the devil, doing it wrong. Then he has this hotshot preacher shows up from another nation, comes in, and he's the most famous figure of this great awakening. Jonathan Edwards going, well, hey, what about me? I've been in the trenches now for two decades. You just show up, and your name's on all the posters. And then, to top it all off, he gets fired by the very church that he gave his life serving to. And then when he finally gets his due, he finally gets his position, finally it all comes down, he drops dead from a smallpox vaccination. And if you were to ask Jonathan Edwards today, was it worth it? I think he'd say yes. Because Jonathan Edwards was a man who knew it's not about me. It's about lifting up the name of Jesus. And if you want to take me and use my life to do that, I will lay my life down and make it happen. See, if we think, if we think spiritual awakening is about a bunch of other people out there, if they'll just get their life together and start acting like us, then we could see spiritual awakening. We've, we've missed what we're praying for. What we're praying for, if we're interested, is for us to be the kind of people that radically surrender our lives to Jesus Christ and 
for the Spirit of God to be able to fall in such a way where the Spirit can do whatever the Spirit wants to do, and we will welcome every bit of spiritual warfare that comes with it, as messy as it will be. And if that means that we get fired from our church, then so be it. If the name of Jesus goes up, we're okay. I want to finish this morning, and I want to read to you a passage of Scripture from Joel. And I want you just to listen to it. This is the prophet Joel. Prophet Joel was speaking in days of dead orthodoxy, nominal religion, and perfunctory religion. And he's been saying about how judgment's coming, and God's going to judge him because of that. In the middle of all that, though, he says this. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, who relents of disaster. And who knows whether He will not turn and relent and leave behind a blessing. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. And between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, let them weep and say, Spare your people, O God, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the people? Where is your God? See, that's the invitation. So I just leave the question on the table again. Do you really want spiritual awakening? If God in heaven is looking down at our nation and say, you know what, I want to bring a spiritual awakening. And it starts with you. If you will go to the woods for a year, two years, three years, four years, and then I will gather several people in this church they are also going to the woods, and y'all will begin to pray for a year, for two years, for three years, for four years, for five years. And then after that, then I will fall. Would we sign up for that? Would we say, I am in, I am all in, I will be the one who will go to the woods when no one else will see. And I will seek your face. And I will lay my life before you. And I will forsake everything that is in opposition to the name of Jesus Christ. Because I hunger for spiritual renewal. Before we close today, I just want to remind you, the third Wednesday of every month, we set aside as a day of prayer and fasting. And that's not this Wednesday, but it's next Wednesday. It's June 17th. And our focus for that night is going to be praying for spiritual awakening. So remember that. Uh, as, as you think about what these things mean, and as we hear God call us to say, if I'm going to bring spiritual awakening and I want to start it with you, do we say yes? Let's pray together. Father, so often we pray for things and we don't really know what we're praying for. We pray for revival. We pray for spiritual awakening. We pray for you to fall upon our church and fall upon our community and fall upon our nation. And I'll just confess what we're really saying is we want you to fix other people. And what you're waiting for is for individuals who will forget praying about others and will just... Pray for ourselves. Father, fix us. Renew us. Awaken us. Quicken our spirits. Convict us of our sin. May we lay aside everything that is not in obedience to the name of Christ. May everything in our life serve to lift up the name of Jesus. Would we devote our time and our talents and our energy and our resources for kingdom? Would we really say, you have my life and do what you wish? Would we come after you in prayer week after week after week? 
seeking your face, praying, asking, begging that you would pour out your Spirit upon us as individuals, upon our church, and upon our nation. So Father, we cry out, bring awakening, and Father, would you start with me Father, would you fall on me? Would you quicken my spirit? Would you quicken my affections? Would you quicken my passion? Would you quicken my devotion? Would you quicken my commitment? Would you grab my heart? Would you move? Father, that's how we pray. Why don't we stand together as we sing. I just want to open this altar to us. As as people are standing and and singing around you, if if you want to come and just kneel and let that be your prayer, Lord, bring spiritual awakening and let us start with me. If you want to pray that from the pew, you're fine. But we open up the altar and invite you to come and pray as we worship together.